over at uh, lewrockwell.com, there's a, an article by Doug Casey. And uh, let me just brag about Doug Casey first. Well, I'm not really bragging. I'm complimenting him, or that's my intent anyway. Doug Casey is a brilliant man. He um, is very successful in life. He has a wonderful idea that he's uh, that he's able to um, bring to life in South America, and I think he's really on the right track on a lot of stuff. I think a person could not uh, go wrong in studying the writings of Doug Casey and listening to him speak and really giving an ear to this man because uh, he's extremely knowledgeable. He is very wise, and you, and I should make a distinction here. You know, there's a lot of people that are really knowledgeable, and they're idiots. But Doug Casey is very wise. He's very knowledgeable, and he has put legs to that knowledge and that wisdom. And he is, uh, you know, he's going to make it through whatever he faces. Now, having said that, he, his article over at Lou Rockwell titled End of the Nation State and I'll put a link to it in today's show notes on badquaker.com. But this, it's a good article. I like it. It's not a very long article. I was, when I started, I was actually hoping that it would have been longer and more in-depth, especially towards the end. When I was getting at the end of the article, I was thinking, man, Doug, you could have put on four or five more paragraphs here. You know, I, I really enjoyed the article. And uh, I, I would love to meet Doug Casey. He he just seems like he would be a fascinating individual to spend, you know, like a whole day just sitting with him and just letting him talk and just, you know, just absorbing what he has to say. just And just asking him questions about his life and about his thoughts of the future and so forth. I would just, that would, that would be like an ideal afternoon for me. Um, however, now having having said all those wonderful things about Doug Casey, there's some flaws in this article, and um, I can't help but to point them out. Hey, above and beyond the flaws that I'm going to mention, I, I really want to emphasize that this is a good article. It only takes a couple minutes to read it. It's well worth the time, and it's well worth the effort. Uh, please go to badquaker.com, hit that link, go over and read the article uh, by Doug Casey. Now, in the article, The End of the Nation State, uh, he talks, he, unfortunately, there are a couple of fallacies that the state has put great emphasis on teaching all of us. Um, it's much like, you know, I was talking the other day about lies that were told about the Old West, about the American West. And how, you know, the, everything was, uh, murder was rampant and they were robbing trains right and left and banks were being shot up. And all these things are, are lies. They're, they were originally lies told by uh, authors who wanted to sell dime novels and were willing to say anything in order to, uh, you know, in order to sell dime novels on the East Coast, on the East Coast to people who had never been West and would never go West. So they could just pretty much make up anything and sell it to these people. And then later, these same types of sensationalism and, and uh, you know exaggerations and so forth were picked up by Hollywood for the same purpose and with the same, uh, you know, with the same vigor as the dime novelists had done. And the state figured out at some point in time that these lies were useful for the purposes of the state. So government history books have been adjusted to more towards meeting, you know, the dime novels and the movies than actually portraying the West as it really was. And I talked before about uh, there's a couple on the on uh, badquaker.com uh I think it was like last Thursday or Friday or maybe both days when I was talking about this and I put links to wonderful articles that um, debunk all these myths about the Old West. Well, um, just like the state has lied about the Old West, and just like history books lie about the Old West, and just like modern conceptions uh, painted by uh, Hollywood and by novels and so forth, uh, just like those are, are pretty much all false about the Old West, much of what we're told about ancient and medieval times is also simply lies made up by the state, um, lies made up 
sometimes to glorify events and individuals, sometimes made up to glorify the state itself, sometimes you know pushed by the state in order to uh, perpetuate the myth of the state. But one way or the other, um, there are distortions and lies of what the past was really like. And unfortunately, uh, Doug, in this article, it's clear that Doug um, uh, believes some of these myths and lies, and he places some of his um, some of his uh, projections of the future, unfortunately, based on these misunderstandings of of history. So, uh, I wanted to touch a couple of them. Uh, the first being the idea that. Um, you know that oh how does he say it let's see let me just read a little bit of it here and again in reading this you know these are not my words so oftentimes when i read someone of this intellectual capability i don't um they use words that i don't use so forgive my clumsiness and my awkwardness as i read someone else's words this is the section that is named the industrial revolution and the end of kingdoms and Doug says, uh, from about 12,000 B.C. to roughly mid-1600s, and by that he means 1600s A.D., or, or current era, however you want to put it. Anyway, back to his work. From about 12,000 B.C. to roughly the mid-1600s, the world's cultures were organized under strong men, ranging from petty lords to kings, pharaohs, or emperors. Now, I want to break off there, and I'll get back to reading uh, this same section in just a second, but what I wanted to point out in this is is his flawed understanding of that time frame and i've i 've done several articles talking about the birth of the state Jericho and what you know what was happening around that time um, so if you 've heard some of this before, just stick with me i 'm not going to really emphasize a lot on that i 'm just going to go past it. Um, but ancient Jericho was the first known example of the state. Uh, it appeared about 11,000 years ago or roughly 9,000 B.C. Prior to Jericho, prior to ancient Jericho, there is no evidence of any state existing in any form. Um, Jericho is the absolute oldest uh, um, settlement that we have ever found any evidence of where we have evidence of a state existing. Now, that's not to say it's the oldest settlement. There are lots of settlements older than Jericho. But Jericho is the first settlement where we see the, the key things that had to be there in order for a state to exist. And we also have actual physical evidence of the state, and that being a, a, a skirt wall and a, and a defensive tower. Prior to Jericho, we do not see settlements with skirt walls and defensive towers. Um, but in addition to that piece of evidence, the other evidence that we have that the state was birthed at Jericho is the fact that prior to Jericho in roughly 9000 BC, uh, settlements that you see anywhere that you find them in the world, settlements would typically... Uh, involve uh, farming communities, evidence of trading, evidence of advanced pottery sometimes, sometimes evidence of metallurgy. Um, but you would not see the overproduction of grain. You would not see walls and towers. You would see homes, but you would not see walls and towers. This is the, this is the, 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 this is the, the stark difference. With the overproduction of grain you have two things that can happen. You have, instantly you have taxation is possible with the overproduction of grain, and you have slaves that are possible with the overproduction of grain. If you don't have the overproduction of slave, of, if you don't have the overproduction of grain, you do not have the possibility of having slaves. And with the overproduction of grain, you can have taxation. You cannot have taxation prior to, uh, because we're talking about prior to um, uh, hard currency, you know, m money being uh, like gold and silver and so forth. Um, prior to that discovery, grain was uh, the, the and best form of taxation, 
best as far as the state's concerned, that is, not as far as the farmers were concerned. So that's what we have at Jericho, roughly 9,000 B.C., about 11,000 years ago. We have this instantaneously, we have this birth of the state, and we don't see the state appearing anywhere else on the face of the globe for another 2,000 years. So the state existed in Jericho for 2,000 years without any evidence of the state existing anywhere else. Uh, and that's one more piece of evidence as to why we know that the tower in Jericho indicated that there was a state. Because if there was another st city-state nearby, then it would make sense for the regular people there to have a tower for defensive purposes against some invading state. But there was no invading state. As a matter of fact, the tower was too small to hold anything more than maybe as little as 20 people, maybe as many as 50. So in a valley of thousands of residents, only 20 to 50 of them could actually defend themselves in this tower. So that means it was not a, a defensive structure to, to defend the, uh, the people of the valley. It was a defensive structure to defend the state against the people of the valley. The state, at its very birth, was nothing more than a gang of robbers who had decided to stay in one place, who had found it easier to fortify themselves in one location and ride out from that location and rob and return safely to that location, rather than going out on highways and, uh, and raiding in, in that fashion. Now, if we go back to, uh, to, the, the, to that point, 11,000 years ago when the birth of Jericho took place, uh, like I said, there's no evidence of a state prior to that. But there's many things that we have evidence of. For example, 40,000 years ago, um, they, there have been multiple uh, musical instruments found in Germany from about 40,000 years ago. People were literally making and playing flutes and, and music in Germany 40,000 years ago. Now, that, that's not evidence of farming or a settlement, but having a musical instrument is a sign of prosperity, and it's a sign of culture. Um, however, we do see farming in New Guinea about the same time. Now, just because there's no evidence of farming in Germany doesn't mean farming didn't exist. It just means that there were no uh, massive fortifications. There was no, you know, there was none of the scars on the land that would stay for 40,000 years and, and give us hints that they were there, which also indicates that there was no state because, you know, scarring of the land is one of the key char characteristics of the state. So... Um, so we have prosperity going on in Germany to the point of where there's, uh, you know, the, the, the spare time to create musical instruments. And that generally comes from having a farming culture. The, the true hunter and gatherers, you don't have a whole lot of spare time, um, but once you begin farming, then you begin to have more and more spare time. So finding musical instruments, finding flutes in Germany is indication that, they're, that, the, that the people there were prosperous and they probably had spare time. So, and, if, and if there was farming in New, Guinea, in New Guinea at roughly the same time, you can probably assume there was farming in Germany as well. Well, where you have farming, you have permanent settlements. Now, the first permanent settlements that we know of in Europe... This is what we've actually uncovered, and we can stand there and point to it and say, right here it is. It was about 30,000 years ago in the Czech Republic. That's not that far from Germany where, where the flutes were found. But we're still talking about roughly 20,000 years before Jericho. Roughly 20,000 years before Jericho. Now, keep this in mind. Jericho was only, what, 11,000 years ago. But for 20,000 years, there were settlements without a state that we can prove, that we know of. So, if there was no state, now what does that mean? If, how can you have a settlement with no state? And what's the real difference here, and what's, what's the flaw in what Doug Casey was talking about? The, the flaw is that the idea that you have to have a strong man, that you have to have 
a a uh, a king of some kind, some kind of a thug that runs an organization of some kind. No, that's that's called crime. And that's what the state is. The state is basically just the most successful crime gang. And we don't have any actual evidence of that existing until Jericho. Now, that's not to say there was no crime, and that's not to say there were no thugs or there were no gangs. But clearly it wasn't enough of a problem. It wasn't enough of a problem to, to make any kind of major attempt to put up defensive structures. So in all likelihood... Any kind of that, any activity of that type was uh, a matter of small roving bands of thieves that would strike a community and then not stick around because obviously the community would do something about it. So uh, once again, until that, that group settled down in one location, which happened to be the rocky outcropping at Jericho, that's the first evidence we have that that, that that gang of thieves would have settled down into one location and robbed out from that location rather than roving uh, and, and robbing hit and run and move from place to place hoping not to get caught. So for 20,000 years that we know of, humans existed in farming communities without the state, without any kind of... Uh, uh, compulsory leadership, if we want to put it that way. And keeping in mind that compulsory leadership has to have a, a structure around it to defend it from, from, the, um, uh, from those that are being exploited, if we can put it that way. Because, you know, if you just think about it, if there's just a, a, a big shot who happens to be a bully and pushes people around and taxes them, if he doesn't have some method of defending himself, somebody's going to cut his throat in the middle of the night. And that's actually, if you read um, The Art of Not Being Governed by James C. Scott, that's exactly what you see among the mountainous uh, non-state people, is that as soon as someone begins to develop into some type of a proto-state, some type of a proto-king, some type of a, you know, more than just an honored tribal leader, when they, they actually start to express state-like authority, someone just kills them. Um, and, and that's why that, you know, the, lo the logical progression then for the thug is to build some kind of dis uh, defensive structure. So we have, uh, from the time that we know that settlements were taking place in Europe about uh, that was about 30,000 years ago and we know that farming was taking place in um, in New Guinea about 40,000 years ago and we have evidence that farming was taking place in Germany about 40,000 years ago and it wasn't until 11,000 years ago that the first evidence of the state appeared and during that time and this is what we know to be the case there was farming, there was advanced pottery, there was art, there was jewelry, there was music, and there were settlements all, pretty much all around the world without any evidence of a state. There was seed exchange. Um, there's, there are people who are geeks, who are seed geeks, who trace the history of specific uh, varieties of seeds. And, and, there, and the distribution network of seeds prior to the existence of the state is, is amazing. Now, I mentioned the overproduction of grain a minute ago. When the, over, when the state, about the time that the state appeared at Jericho, was the exact moment that the overproduction of grain took place. Prior to the existence of the state, um, the farming areas, uh, pretty much everywhere that we can find uh, evidence of farming, you, you have a variety of farming things, things that were farmed. You have animal husbandry going on, and you have uh, shepherding going on, and you have a variety of different things. Specifically in, in, the, uh, in the Jordan River Valley, where Jericho is located, you had um, you know, figs, you had grapes, you had all, uh, hemp, you had poppies, you had all kinds of things being grown uh, as crops. But then when the state appears... That all narrows down, and you start having the overproduction of grain. And so that's one of the characteristics that you have of a state is that, because as I was saying, grain made an easy method of taxation. Prior to the state, um, 
individual farmers had what might be called stash holes, or you might say they were, um, you know, like a root cellar or whatever. It would be a spot that you might hide things from, uh, from you know, uh, thieves that might come around your, your farm trying to steal something from you. But more likely, it was just a place in the ground, a dugout place in the ground, to store uh, a year's worth of goods so that you could make it through a, a bad year or so that you could get it through the winter. But when, this, when the state appeared, all of a sudden you have less and less of those and you have large storage areas protected by the walled, uh, the walling activity of the state. So it's where they were actually taxing uh, mostly the grain and then bringing it back in and guarding it away from the people who they had stolen it from. And then the use of all this grain to feed their slaves to do what? To build stronger walls, to keep them safer, to, you know, to, uh, to feed their armies that uh, would now go and rob other communities so that the state could actually reach into other, like in the case of Jericho, you can only rob so much from the one valley there in Jordan. So if you have uh, an, enough of an army, you can move over the mountains and rob the next valley over. And you can then uh, begin to, you know, uh, expand out your area of influence further and further away. You, but you're limited on how far you can go with that, you know, just due to how far men can march and how, uh, whether or not you have horses or whatever as transportation. So, um, so that's the real image of what we have in uh, uh, ancient days. And it's not at all this image that the state wants us to believe where slowly strongmen were recognized in the village and then the next thing you know they were a little bit stronger and then they were a little bit stronger and pretty soon in order for everybody to feel protected they gave more and more of their rights over to this small group of people who slowly became kings and sta in the state and so forth. That, that never happened. That's, a, that's a, a vision of history that just didn't take place. Okay, um, let me read. Uh, let me read the rest of this thing here before I run out of time. Um, the Industrial Revolution and the End of Kingdoms. From about 12,000 BC to roughly the mid 1600s, the world's cultures were organized under strong men, ranging from petty lords to kings, pharaohs, and emperors. It's odd to me, at least, how much of the human animal seems to like the idea of monarchy. It's mythologized, especially in medieval context, as a system with noble knights, fair princesses, and brave knights. Oops, I read that wrong. Noble kings, fair princesses, and brave knights riding out of castles on a hill to right injustices. Um, and then he says uh, it was actually quite different from that. I'll kind of give a. I'll just breeze through this. They were more like little Tony Sopranos, or perhaps like little Stalins. The princesses were unbathed, uh, unbathed hags, he calls them. Uh, the, the knights were not more than hired killers, and the shining castle on the hill was nothing more than a headquarters of a concentration camp with plenty of dungeons for the politically incorrect. Well, you know, there's not as much evidence of that as you would, as you would think. Sure, uh, you know, there were, generally speaking, you would have a place to lock people up, in a in a castle but but really and truly like i was saying a second ago the castles were not concentration camps the ca the castles were where the state went to hide from the people okay uh, back to doug's thing here he says with kingdoms loyalties weren't so much to the country a nebulous and arbitrary concept but to the ruler you were the subject of a king first and foremost your linguistic ethnic religious and other affiliations were secondary it's strange how when people think of kingdoms, uh, when they think of the kingdoms of, oops, when they think of the kingdom period of history, they think only in terms of what the ruling class did and had. Even though, if you were born then, the chances were 98%, okay, now here's the flaw, now hear this part. Even though, if you were born then, the chances were 98%, you'd be a simple peasant who owned nothing, knew nothing, beyond what your betters told you, and sent most of his surplus production to his rulers. But again, the gradual accumulation of capital and, capital and knowledge made the next step possible, the Industrial Revolution. Now, 
at this point, uh, I need to point out the I need to point out the flaw here. This idea, this is kind of like a you know almost a, a cartoonish version of it is in Monty Python's um, Holy Grail, where the peasant is sitting in in a you know in a mud puddle. Uh, digging for worms, and the king comes riding up, and and they begin their their classic conversation between the uh, the uh, the peasant in the mud pile and the king, and and this is, you know, that's the personification of this myth that the that the state likes to portray. The state likes us to think today that what we have is so much better than what it was in the medieval times because they were just sitting around digging through mud eating worms back then. Only the king was living high. Well, when in fact, uh, Doug is right when he says that they, you know, they were um, unbathed uh, and this kind of thing. To a certain extent, that's right. You know, if you think about the table of King Henry VIII, we imagine it today. We see it in movies where he's got a turkey leg in his hand and he's, you know, big piles of food and he's engor- in just engorging himself. Well, first off, they didn't have turkeys in Europe in King in Henry the Eighth's day. So he couldn't have been eating a, a turkey leg. But uh in addition to that, things in Europe at the time of great rarity were like pepper. That would have been a, a great um luxury to to have pepper with your meals. Uh spice wise they were extremely limited, whether you were a king or a peasant. Uh, you, you 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 know you had salt that was pretty much it that was the magic spice that was that was it very few people in europe uh could afford anything beyond salt so yeah life was pretty rough even for the king it was not all that great on the other hand and hans hermann hoppe has pro- hoppe has probably done more work on this uh more work to shine the light on this than anybody else i'm aware of but if you read um uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's book, Democracy, the God that Failed. And also, if you can get your hands on the impossibility of limited government and the prospects of a second American revolution. Now, this is a much shorter piece. It's actually more like a paper. It's not a book. But uh, you can get, the, if you look at, well, maybe I'll put a link to it on the on badquaker.com uh, so that you can get a hold of that because that's not all that common. On the, lim- on the impossibility of limited government and the prospects of, of a second American Revolution, in in that and in uh, Democracy, the God that Failed, Hans Hermann Hoppe very clearly shows that medieval life was not the way we're told. Your peasant, your he, your peasant was not rich in any way, but on the other hand, the peasant ha- faced no taxes, no taxation of any kind. The European uh, peasant was not a slave. The European peasant uh, stayed in one location because it was most economically viable for him to do so, but he could at any time leave. He was not an owned individual. The, 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 the noble class, on the other hand, there was, this, um, there was this friction between actual kings and the noble class. And the king was simply uh, the richest of a group of nobles. He was usually the richest relative of a group of nobles. And at all times, there was this friction between the nobles and whoever the king was. There was uh, Loyalty really was secondary in the whole thing. The, the poorest people, the, the, the peasants themselves, would have felt loyalty towards the king simply because the king did uh, did things to win their loyalty and maintain their loyalty. He would have big feasts for the peasants, and he would, you know, hand out free things and stuff like this. He being the richest uh, of the local nobility, but there was always this friction between the other nobility and the king, and the king would would pit the parent the peasants against the other nobility to keep the nobility in check. And the nobility would would constantly be scheming among among themselves on how to kill the king and replace him with one of with one of them. So this was a process that that most that means that most of the peasantry uh, 
uh, had no taxation whatsoever. Now, if they lived on the land of a nobleman, then uh, much like a sharecropper, a good portion of what they grew on the land belonged to the nobleman. But it was the nobleman's land. They were employees. Now, this is not a whole lot different than if you're, you know, if you work in a bicycle factory, you don't own the bicycles that you produce. You you make a living off of it. The 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 owner of the bicycle factory pays you enough of his income that you can make a living. Otherwise, you would go someplace else. But you don't own everything that you produce when you work at the bicycle factory. And medieval times was no different with farming. Um, you didn't own 100% of the production of the farm that you worked on because you didn't own the farm you lived, that you worked on. Uh, the, the nobleman owned the land. And if you wanted to own land, you had to go outside of the reach of the nobleman. And that was possible. You could do that. People did it all the time. The problem was, now you're going into a country where uh, there's likely, you know, the big problem with Europe in medieval times was that there were wolves. There was a there was a, a, a breed of huge wolves that didn't really get exterminated until way late, almost near the birth of modern states around 1600 or so. I can't remember exactly when that, that huge wolf went extinct. And I'm not sure. There may still be some of those big wolves in the Pyrenees. I'm not sure one way or the other about that. Uh, I was thinking they were extinct, but they, but there may still be some remaining somewhere. But that was a major problem. If you're going to go out and go off into the woods and try to start your own uh, you know, farm and, and, and be a free person like that, you're going to face all the difficulties. Uh, you're going to lose all the advantages of being uh, under, the, uh, under the agreement with that, uh, with that nobility, that he, the things that he was providing for you, uh, things like already tilled land, things like ready-made buildings and, and housing and so forth, stuff that he owned that he was providing for the people who worked on his farm. If you wanted to, you could go out and try it on your own. Uh, but you just had to carry all the difficulties and and you know uh, and all the risks yourself rather than having the nobility do that now when you're when you're thinking of these things, you really need to um, you know Doug kind of threw all of the kings and emperors and everything together, but you really need to see empires and kings differently um, you know the empires did pretty much function the way Doug Casey is talking about there. Everybody got taxed in an empire because the empire was, that's kind of what it was. An empire is far more like where everyone is a slave, where the medieval uh, system was not. Um, there were, certainly there were slaves, but typically the slaves were owned by by the nobility and or the king, and they were more like house servants and that kind of thing. But the peasantry were not slaves. On the other hand, with empires, pretty much everybody was a slave. And uh, so, so that's why you need to think of them differently. And that's the thing about the modern state. You know, slavery was done away with uh, most places in sometime around the early to mid-1800s. That's at the same time the state was really coming into its maturity, well, into its modern phase of its maturity. It still has further to go to mature, but, but into this stage of its maturity, it was moving into that stage in the early to mid-1800s. And uh, at the same time, uh, chattel slavery was disappearing. And the reason why is because we were, trans, we, were, we, were, we were moving out of the early stage of the state moving into the modern uh, stage of the state where everyone is a slave now. So we don't have slavery in the sense that uh, we had slavery in the early 1800s, but at this point with the state, everyone is a slave. Even people inside the state, even, even people inside government are still slaves to the state. So, so this was a trade-off that took place where the peasantry was actually far more free in medieval times than they are now. Uh, and the reason why is because of that transition. Uh, it, we went from having a certain, you know, certain groups as slaves to this transition where now we are all slaves. And if you don't think you're not a slave, um, the, the classic 
definition of a slave in the olden days was was that your travel was limited. You couldn't just come and go as you pleased. Uh, you couldn't travel long distances without written permission of some kind to take with you to prove who you were and and to whom you belonged and uh, how long you were going to be there. And when you were coming back, you weren't allowed to just go uh, wherever you wanted like that. Uh, next, the most obvious thing was slaves were not allowed to be armed. Um, if a slave, oftentimes, if a slave uh, was found to be armed, unless he specifically had the permission of his master, he was likely to be killed on the spot. And slaves were pressed to uh, to look differently than the free classes. So, for example, in most of history, and there are, there are exceptions to this, but in most of history, uh, slaves had their heads shorn and their faces shaved for the males. And uh, decorative um, things like earrings or other piercings or tattoos were signs uh, of slavery oftentimes. But there was some kind of a physical... Uh, markings to prove that a person was a slave. Well, uh, that's pretty much what we're moving towards right now. We're moving towards everyone having some type of a um, identification to prove that they're a slave, and they have to have that identification to move around, and they're not allowed to, be, to arm themselves in the ways that they would like to. That's where we're at. And that's why I say um, we uh, peasants were not slaves in medieval times. They were not even taxed. Uh, but now, the slave class has been eliminated in the sense that it was in the early 1800s. And now all people are slaves. And if you don't register properly, or if you attempt to look differently, or if you attempt to weaponize yourself, you will be singled out and you will be gotten rid of.